Hey, good morning. Welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church here out of New York Mills, Minnesota. I don't know where you're at. I don't know where you get to view this video. We're just so excited that you've taken some time here to be in the Word of God with us. You know, one of the great joys of this Word of God that we have in all its purity, it's for one thing to make us wise into salvation. So whatever has been going on for you this week, um, our, our prayer for you is God uh, strengthens you, protects you physically, emotionally, and especially strengthens you in this faith that is in the death and resurrection, what we have in Jesus Christ for our forgiveness, faith, and life eternal. Now, because of this partnership you're, you've been in with us, number one, we've been cherishing your prayers as God guides us as we continue this ministry. As you've seen, coming on now on Wednesdays, we've been experimenting with a devotional, uh, just a six, seven minute devotional that we hope uh, equips and enables you uh, throughout the rest of the week. And then coming together on this Sunday, we, we cherish uh, those prayers that you've been holding us up in. We also want to thank you for the gifts that God has so wondrously provided for us in order to continue this ministry. We've had a couple of different families that have asked that it be given in a memorial uh, to, in the honor of a loved one who was instrumental in bringing the word of Jesus to them. Uh, that's really been cool to see those kind of notes. The other thing, as always, we encourage you to subscribe. So all this new stuff that's coming, we're looking at some other formats that are coming that we can bring the Word of God to you wherever you're at and whatever vocation that God brings you in to, during the day. And then also, this is an opportunity to share. This is one of the things we've been seeing with our midweek. Uh, it's, it's shared quite a bit. And some of the um, comments and messages we've been getting back uh, it's kind of fascinating to watch how this goes, so thank you for being part of that. So, so 
life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able My fellow believers in Jesus Christ, there's a significant event in your life. It's called your baptism. You see, by the power of God's word, God came to you and placed in you forgiveness, faith, and life eternal by the power of his word. While we're an enemy and dead in our sins, and we're absolutely hopeless because we were born in sin and conceived in sin. And by God's grace and in his mercy, he came to each and every one of us and poured upon you his holy precious blood in your baptismal waters. And these words of invocation were marked you as one of Christ's redeemed. So this morning we make that same beginning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's text comes from the Gospel of Luke. It's a very familiar uh, gospel lesson. As we see it in the 16th chapter, beginning with the 19th verse, as we hear about the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Now there was a rich man. He habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs from which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes being in torment and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I'm in agony in, in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. And now he's being comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able and that none may cross over from there to us. And he said to them, him, then I beg you, father, and you send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers in order that he may warn them so that they will not also come in this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. In the name of Jesus. You know, I, since I've been a young kid, I've always had a fascination of all things with bridges. And the one that set out probably the most drastic picture of uh, in my mind on a bridge was called the Royal Gorge out of Canyon City, Colorado. It built, was built in 1929, and in six months, that 1,053-foot tall suspension bridge was over this gorge. It was amazing to me how, the, how it was put together, the cables that held it up, and I got to walk across it with my mom and dad. It was amazing, because that's 1,260 feet long. Then later on in my life, uh, as I used to travel around for business and stuff, I came across another bridge that just fascinated me to no end. And that's the New River Gorge out of Victor, West Virginia. That is the tallest, longest, single span suspension when it was built in 1974. It amazed me that what used to take before that time more than between 45 minutes and an hour to go down in the gorge with your vehicle and then climb back up on the other side and then get there. And within 10 minutes or less, you're across the bridge nowadays. But my all-time favorite, absolutely my all-time favorite is the Mighty Mac, the Mackinac Bridge across the Straits of Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. 
five miles that bridge is, uh, expands that, that massive water built in 1954. Now, that's the other thing that fascinates me, how God enabled engineers and, and men and women in the construction industry of bridge building would come and design these things and they're, they're still standing today with literally millions of people in vehicles going across them safely of these masses expanses of space, <laughs> literally sometimes when you look all the way down and do it safely. Today, we're talking um, in, our, in, our, in our gospel lesson today, we're talking about a, a spance, an expanse or a gorge or a chasm as some of our translations call it. And, and there's, there's three of these separations that come about. And today, as we see these, we see where through the gospel of Jesus Christ, he spans the ultimate chasm or gorge between man and God, and that's called our sinful flesh. And he did it through not a bridge, but through a cross that he would allow himself to be a one-time sacrifice where there would be no more separation between man and God. Now, our parable today in the Gospel of Luke, in that 16th chapter, beginning with that 19th verse, right away we see a spread of distance. Now, we're not talking about economical spreads like socialism always is trying to pound in on us, but it is where people, while they're here on this earth, put their trust in their forgiveness, their faith, and in their salvation. We have a rich man, and as we know it, as Lazarus. Now, when Luke opens up Jesus' word in this parable, we gotta remember who Jesus has been talking to. All the way through these gospels that we've been reading through chapter 15, 15 and 16, is where we've been seeing Jesus is telling about the relationship that God has with his people while they're here on this earth. And he calls us and those at the time to repentance and saving faith in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Today, the parable is now talking about what's next. What the result of the rejection of the Messiah. The, re the result of the rejection of the promise and now the, the certainty that we have in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, the rich man, many scholars believe that he was the high priest. And part of that of the time could have been Caiaphas. We're not quite sure. But, and we don't know if Jesus was pointing him out. But he's also mainly talking to all the mumblers and grumblers that we've been looking at throughout these passages, whether it be the parables of, of, the, of the lost sheep, the lost coins, the prodigal son. And, and today what we're seeing now is this parable talking about how, because of sinful man, are separating themselves. Now the mumblers and grumblers are the ones that are rejecting Jesus. The ones that hear the message of hope and comfort and certainty that's him and the Messiah. And actually they're grumbling against God because that takes away from where they're putting their hope in, in themselves and who they are. So what we're looking at, the rich man could have been the high priest of the day. Because they said he is robed in habitually in purple and fine linen. Now the fine linen is, for all you out there, it's your undergarments, your BVDs. They were in fine silken garments. And you'll see that in the Old Testament where the priests were supposed to clothe themselves in that. But he was doing this habitually to show who he was. Now, you also got to remember, the Jews at the time believed the poor, those that were sick, those that were slaves, were less loved by God. See, if you were wealthier and you were a higher astute of whoever you were, you were more loved by God, which led them down you might say a garden path of destruction. Now Lazarus, this is a separation too, not financially, not due to order of whoever they were, but because of the situation he was in. You see, according to the culture around him, they saw him as repulsive and somebody that is separated from God. Look at him, number one, he's broken and busted. Whether he was physically, um, we don't know, paralyzed or whether he, whatever it was, he could not move himself. He was laid at the table, uh, outside um, the rich man's table, hoping to be fed somehow. That also means he could not ever come before the presence of God, according to those that were around of the culture, because he wasn't whole. 
Second of all, he had open wounds. So again, there, no good Jew would go around him. Because if you touched anything bloody or dirty, you could not be in the temple. And the Jews mainly saw at the time, the temple was the place where it was you gathered and got to be seen. Thirdly, the dogs were licking his wounds. Dogs always equated in the Bible as a repulsive thing. Not like our, our, our foo-foo dogs that we got around today that they think as our camera gal today is saying that they think they're a human. That's not the case in the case of the Jews. These were always, you look at it in the Old Testament, these were the, the critters that came in and ate the corpses after a battle. They were repulsive and they made Lazarus even more rejectable around them. So there was a great chasm even there. Now, the rich man put his hope not only in his status and what he had, but who he was. He believed because he was a descendant of Abraham, he had all his stuff together. And that's where he put his hope. Lazarus was destitute. He had no hope except in his God. And we see where both of them die. Now, the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. That means heaven. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away at Lazarus' bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham. See, he still identifies I'm a descendant of Abraham, even when he's in hell. He's still justifying who he was and what he was. And did you notice he tells Father Abraham, send Lazarus down. He saw Lazarus no more than a slave. <coughs> not what he did. He's not confessing even in the midst of hell. It is said when, you know, some people think, well, if somebody goes to hell, uh, maybe they'll have a second chance. Maybe they'll see what they did wrong and they'll confess. And obviously you can see this rich man who rejected the gospel, rejected the Messiah, put his hope in himself and his status and who he was, still didn't even, reject, didn't even confess in hell. I forget who said it, hell's locked from the inside. The locks aren't from the outside because people have locked their hearts against the Messiah. You see, people aren't sent to hell. They choose to be there. While they're here on this earth, when they reject the gospel, they reject the Messiah, Jesus Christ, they don't want anything part of him. Hell is the ultimate place where you are separated from God. And that's this picture that Jesus is saying in his parable, this great chasm, this great gorge that is unable to cross over. It is said that part of the torment of hell is being able to see the perfection of heaven and not be there. I don't know. I do go back to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve and saw that what they were removed from, what their sin brought them to until the Garden of Eden was destroyed in the flood. I don't know. I do know in this case where the rich man was putting everything in who he was, what he was, he was telling, he was telling Abraham, God, you know, send even Lazarus back to my, my kinfolk and therefore they'll believe him. You know what God said? They have the prophets of Moses. They have the word of God. So do you and I. You know, we live in a world that might look at the simplistic the simplicity of our faith and say, what a bunch of fools. We, we live in a world that uh, it promotes all kinds of things that is supposedly value here on this earth. Now this parable is not saying it is a sin to be wealthy, whatever wealthy is nowadays. Uh, it's not saying that you are more wretched because you are poor. Because see, the rich man was poor in grace and Lazarus was rich in the Messiah. Too often, we're like the, the mumblers and the grumblers of the time of Jesus, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees that were mumbling and grumbling against God. 
and how they were justifying what they are. But my dear children of God, we know in the back of our brains how much we want to justify. We are condemned because of our sinful nature to hell. But I have good news for you. Remember what Jesus said to the, or God said, Abraham said to the rich man. He said, they have Moses and the prophets. So do you and I. It's called this precious word of God. This precious word of God that has made you and I wise into salvation. Regardless how large we think the gorge or the expanse between God and us is because of our sinful nature and our fallen wicked ways, our God spanned that, not with a bridge, but with a holy cross. Just like this picture that you're seeing right now in this video. Jesus Christ spanned the separation between man and God because of our sinfulness. He spanned hell itself. And then he walked across a cross that he allowed himself to be put to death on and grabs you and I where we could not place ourselves in any way, provide for ourselves in anything that would give us the love of Jesus Christ. And he takes those nail pierced hands as he crosses that cross and he picks us up. And he gathers us to him in his very, on our very baptisms as we're baptized into that death. By the power of his word, he placed that faith in us while we were dead and enemy and hopeless and repulsive. And he says, my child, I've forgiven you. And I've placed that faith in you. Faith in my death and resurrection because I've spanned what has separated man and God since man decided to become a God. You want proof in that? Every bridge I've ever crossed. I've done everything from uh, suspension bridges. I've done it with heavy equipment. I've done it with, uh, oh, we used to call tightrope bridges and stuff. You made them Boy Scouts and stuff across creeks and ravines and all that stuff. <laughs> it's always so you can arrive on another place. Now, here's how we have arrived in an empty tomb. See, the empty tomb, not only is it the Father has accepted the sacrifice, that spance of our sinfulness and our wickedness that Christ covered with all of his blood. <laughs> the Father accepted that sacrifice and we're in that empty tomb looking out. We're looking out for the days that are coming. The day that God equips us for every day to be able to rejoice in who we are and the vocation he gives us by grace through faith. I don't know where you're going to travel this week. I don't know if you got to go across any bridges. I don't know if you're going to have to take a four-wheel drive and a winch and grab yourself out of some muck area. I don't know. But I do know this. The same Jesus Christ who has spanned and destroyed sin, death, and power of the devil for you is the same Jesus Christ that is with you always, even to the end of the age. And today... We thank our God for that and the blessing he continues to bestow upon us until we get to see him again where we're going to arrive at the final destination in heaven in his presence for eternity without sin. Of course, that comes to us in one way. His name is Jesus Christ. To him we give this glory, this praise and adoration. And all God's people can't but say, amen. You know, one of the joys that we have since we're redeemed children, we get to stand before a holy God. And that holy God sees us through the blood of Christ. And therefore, we get to pray this prayer that he's given us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, wherever you're going, whatever you're doing, whether it is with full gusto or with aches and pains from years gone by, we go with God's great blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor. Give you his peace. Amen. song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever be and live for you
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we we'll live for you.
like you there is none beside you open up my eyes see and want and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to the 